Okay, this video is part of a series. It's the first in a series, but there should be an annotation on the screen to a full playlist, and also in the description there will be notes and links to um, you know information, more information on what we're going to go on over in this series. Go over in this series. Um, so three years ago, I bought one of these cameras. It's a Wandsview if that's how you say it, wireless IP camera, it's, you know, it does, it has motors so it moves around, night vision, built-in microphone and speakers, and I tell you, I bought it as like a baby cam when my daughter was born, and it worked great. Picture quality isn't that great, but at the time it was 50 or $60, and it's kind of a knockoff camera of some other brands out there that are probably $25 more, um, so I went with the cheaper model, and I've loved it. And uh, I have another baby on the way, and so I ordered a few more of these for me and for my in-laws for when the kids are over there. And even though I ordered the same from the same link, which the first one I bought was the NCB five one five four one W model, they actually sent me a newer model. Uh, it's like sixty four hundred or something like that. Um, either way, from what I've read, even this older model, they look identical um, with the newer firmware. Is a little different. I noticed when I got it. So originally, when you get these these um, devices, again, like most things, they want you to install apps and programs on your computer, which I'm not going to do. Um, but luckily, this device has a built-in web interface. So you plug it into your network with a physical network cable. You find it on your network. You go to it as a web page. You log in with username as admin and the default password is one two three four five six once you get in there you can change the password you can change you can add other users with different permissions and you can set it up to connect to your wireless network I'm not going to go over all that because it's pretty straightforward and if you can't figure that out the rest of the series is going to be over your head anyway um, but when I got my the newer version I didn't even realize it was a newer version I put it on my network and I scan it with Nmap like so. So this is the IP address to my new camera. Nmap it. And not only was port 80 open, but there were two other ports open. 8600, which apparently it says it's an asterisk, which I highly doubt there's any phone capabilities on this device. Maybe maybe that has to do with the you know audio that I haven't really messed with. But what really got me was that there's a Telnet server uh, running on this, which I did not have on the older model. Um, so a quick Google brought up a bunch of information on this new firmware, which by the way, even if you're running an older camera, basically this is running uh, firmware, uh, here I'll get it for you, that's the firmware, 51.3.0.152. My older model's running firmware 24 something. So with this particular firmware, you get this Telnet client, and you can Telnet into it with the username root and the password of 123456. And this is great. It gives you, obviously, a lot more functionality if you know what you're doing. Not that great, because even if you change the password in the web interface, it doesn't change it for the Telnet client. So the first thing we want to do is log in and see if we can change that password. So I'm going to use a Telnet client, Telnet into this device using root and 123456, and right away we get greeted with a BusyBox shell, and if we type in BusyBox we can see the commands. Now, this is a great little device. Previous weeks before this we were looking at a smart plug that actually, you know, is 15 to 20 dollars, that has a lot more built in as far as the shell and your SSH instead of Telnet, which is a little more secure, not that it's a big deal if you're on a secure network. And then it had a fairly full busy box, but you look at this and right away, first thing I notice, W gets missing. I've never been on a Linux system that doesn't have WGET until I got on this device. There's no WGET. I also notice there's no churroot, which isn't a big deal because there's not enough storage to really do any churroot rooting on this device, but there's also no netcat. There's also no find command. We're missing a lot of basic functionality programs that, are sh that can be built in a busy box that they stripped away that I would like to have. So can, the first thing I want to do is upgrade this version of busy box. So now I can go get the busy box for, uh, source code and compile it myself, cross compile it on my desktop for a, this is a MIPSL. I don't know if that's really how you say it, but M-I-P-S-E-L uh, processor, so I could cross-compile it for that. 
But for right now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to go and get a pre-built binary file. So let me go to my web browser here. And if you go to busybox.net and you click on download source, there's actually a folder called binaries and there are different versions. You can go to the latest version. And again, there's different version. There's a MIPS one, a MIPS 64. This is a 32 bit here and a MIPSL. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to right click that. Actually, I'm just going to click it and download it. You can um, w get it. I just downloaded it twice by accident. <laughs> so let me go here. I'm splitting the screen here. So the top is still the camera device. The bottom here is uh, my desktop device, my, my desktop. So I'm going to remove that second copy I just accidentally downloaded. Oops. There we go. So right now I have one file in my downloads folder. It's the binary for this. Obviously I can't run it on my desktop because that's not the type of processor I have on my desktop, but I can also do file, the name of that file to make sure, yep, it's compiled for MIPS version one, should be good. Let's look at it here real quick with list dash L H A. Should give me a human readable file size here. It's 1.6 megabytes. So we have two issues here. We have to get it on the device. That's the first thing. We don't have wget. We don't have netcat. There is a thing here that says TFTP. I couldn't figure out how that works. It's not a standard FTP client. Nothing I see in here is really going to help me get something onto this device. If I had wget or netcat, I'd be good. I don't. So how do I get it on this device? Well, I just decided to start poking around the files. Unfortunately, I don't have find, which makes it hard to search the whole drive. But eventually I found that if I cd to system, system, bin, and I list out here, there is an FTP client right here. So I can Put in, put in that full directory, FTP, and put in the IP address. Obviously, I have to have an FTP server, not, server running on my desktop, so I installed one. And now I type in the IP address here, and I'll type in my username for my desktop and my password for my desktop. And now I'm logged in to my desktop. I can move into my downloads folder. I can list out here. I can see that BusyBox file. Okay, so I should be able to get that. I want to pull that down, but I want to pull it down to the proper directory. So before we do that, let's exit out of that. And let's go ahead and do DH, or sorry, DF, and hit enter. And you can see here that we have a few drives mounted. Okay, our root directory is 100% used. Can't put anything there. Our system, that would be a good place to put it. It's 83% used, and we don't, have a right here it's 1.6 megabytes we don't have 1.6 megabytes the hard drive space on this device is not enough for this busy box so I could go compile my own strip out the, the tools I don't want and delete the busy box that's on that device put my copy on and hope that the, the system doesn't crash um, not what I'm ready to do just yet but we have these physical devices, these physical storage uh, units, but we also have our RAM. And if we move into our temp directory, and the temp directory is running in RAM. Well, how much RAM do we have? I can type in the free command, and right here it tells me, well, this is a, there's 30 megabytes of RAM approximately, and free, I have right now over two megabytes. Perfect. And, you know, I have two megabytes, but I think if I list this out, I already have my busy box installed in here. So I'm just going to remove that. Should have done that before the tutorial started. So I just removed the copy of busy box. I'm about to copy back to the device. So if I type in free again, you can see that I have almost four megabytes free. Again, this is in RAM, so I can install whatever program I want to this temp directory. Um, and it will be running in RAM. And so I have almost four megabytes to work with. Although anytime the device reboots, I'm going to lose whatever I put in there. Not a huge deal because I'm not going to be on a daily basis logging into this as a root user uh, or as a shell as root user and running shell commands. I'm going to be editing the GUI interfaces for the web interface. I just need a tool to work on now to make my changes. So. I'm in my temp directory. I have four gigs of free space. I am going to once again FTP into my desktop computer. 
Oop, sorry, got to type in the full system because it's not in the path uh, variable here. System bin FTP my username and password for my desktop. Again, you need to have an FTP server running on your desktop. I'll move into my downloads folder, list out the files in there, and then I'll just say get that file. And I just downloaded it. So I'm going to exit out. I'm going to change mod plus x that file to make sure it's executable. And I'm also going to move it uh, so that it's just called BusyBox. So right now I have two versions of BusyBox on here. The one that's in the, um, I believe it's in the bin directory, it might be under sbin, but I think it's bin. Uh, and then there's this one here. So anytime I want to use this full blown one, so if I just type BusyBox again, that's the default one. You can see there's a few tools on there. But if I do forward slash temp, forward slash um, BusyBox busy and I hit enter, you can see there's a whole lot more tools on the one I just downloaded. That's why it's so much bigger. But some of these tools are going to come in very handy. Again, theoretically, I can um, use Churroot, although there's no storage for another file system on here. The big things are file, wget, netcat, those things can come in handy. Um, so we got that. Uh, something I should have mentioned at the very beginning, I started to and then I got sidetracked, is once we're logged in, we're going to want to change that default password. We can use the default BusyBox for that, so if I just type in BusyBox again, without using the one in the temp directory, we can see that there is a change password command, so I can run that. I'll hit enter and I'll say root colon and I'll give it a new password, I'll just say password. Hit enter and I change the password for root. I can hit enter again to get out of that, don't worry about this missing new password because it was looking for another user after that, but we changed the root. So if I exit out now and I tell net in, I can root and then password is now the password. We officially changed the password, which is even if you're not going to be using this shell, you should log into the telnet and do that to prevent someone else from getting in and messing with your device. Obviously something better than password, but you don't want it to be one, two, three, four, five, six, because that's going to be the first thing someone tries if they're familiar with this device. Okay. We've changed our password. We've got a full version of BusyBox, the latest version of BusyBox running on here. Um, so what do we want to do now? Well, we can do lots of things. And again, uh, I can now temp BusyBox and I can use that to find things. So I can find everything. I can list all the files. So we're going to be using this tool in the next tutorial to start searching through stuff and doing a few other things. But before we really start making any changes to the file system, we'll probably want to make a backup copy of the system in case we screw something up. Uh, we can always factory reset it, but it's good to have our own images stored somewhere else. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this tutorial here. Please check out again the links in the description to get to my website, to see notes for this project, and links to other resources, information on this particular hardware. So I thank you for watching. Please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There should be a link in the description. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Okay, this is an introduction to filmsbychris.com I'm Chris, that's Chris the K that's me right there my daughter Ember and my wife Jennifer we pretty much live in the swamps of Florida I'm a firefighter by day as well as by night, we work long hours but that's not why you're here you're here about the videos I put up on YouTube these videos are mainly about computers and programming, which means most of my videos look something like this. And if that's what you're interested in, great. If not, that's all right. I do videos on other topics too, such as video editing, special effects, photo editing, 3D design, and music creation. If you are one of my viewers and you enjoy my videos, my Patreon page is a place where you can go to help support my videos. So I ask that you take the time to go to my Patreon page and look at the different levels of rewards you can receive for different levels of backing. There should be a link in the description of this video if you are watching it on YouTube. 
Otherwise, you can visit patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. And I thank you for your time and your support. Have a great day.